everyone. Thanks for joining us today on Around the Peninsula. I'm Maria Soreo. We have so much to get to in today's show, so let's start right over at the Terranea Resort, where Terranea turned pink in honor of breast cancer awareness. And because it's the holiday season, those Terranea traditions are just getting started. Let's take a look. We are embarking on the holiday season where Terranea traditions really touches everybody, residents, guests. Tell us about the Terranea traditions coming up. Well, we're starting a little early this year. It will sadly be over by the time people see this piece, but we're starting with a new Terranea tradition, which is our Harvest Festival. We're doing our Thanksgiving to go, as well as all sorts of offerings on property for families who want to join us, whether for a stay or for a meal. And then as we move quickly into the beginning of December, we have things like the tree lighting, which is on the 8th this year. We have breakfast with Santa on the 15th. And then all of our traditional meals around Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and then straight into our big extravaganza, which is water themed this year for New Year's Eve in the ballroom. And layered into that, we have wonderful family-friendly things like gingerbread house offerings, um, mandala ornaments, uh, greeting card making. We're trying to do as much as possible. So there, there's a lot. So contact our experienced concierge or Point Discovery and we can tell you all about the things that are there for the whole family to enjoy together. You know, so many of the things like the tree lighting really has become a part of people's holiday traditions. They come here every year. We have to be at the Terranea tree lighting. And I think that's so special that in 10 years, as we're celebrating, people really have included it in their own family things. Yeah, and I think that word tradition is important. It's not just what we call what we do here. It's what we hope everybody will adopt and, and they, they will bring it as part of their family's traditions. We do have people coming again and again to experience breakfast with Santa or a meal as a family. And I think that's who we are. We're about creating memorable experiences and extraordinary occasions for people. So we hope that they will honor us by coming and sharing with us. Also, Terranea to go, which I've always thought was amazing because some people aren't great cooks or they just want to be able to come here and take it home. That is a brilliant idea. Tell us about how that kind of evolved. Well, I mean, I do it. So hands up, I come and get my turkey and I walk it across and, and take it home. Um, it's, it's a great way to have that family experience without all of the hard work. So you can do everything from pick up just the turkey to the full on meal and we provide enough so there's leftovers the next day and we even provide rolls to make your turkey sandwich um, for breakfast the next day or, or whatever your, your family tradition is. So Terranea turkeys to go and Christmas to go um, we do a big prime rib if anybody wants to pick it up um, for Christmas. So, yeah, don't forget, Sea Beans is there, and we're happy to help. And over at Trump National, we see some of the best golfers in the world. But if you want to learn to play golf or just sharpen your skills, you can do that too. Let's take a look. What we do here is we really look at the individual, okay? Uh, not everyone is built the same, not everyone has the same athletic abilities, not everyone has the same amount of time to put into the game of golf to get better. Everyone has different goals, so you have to teach everyone differently. What we do really well here is we look at the individual and we create a personalized practice program specific to their goals, their body makeup, and their ability to play the game, and where they want to go and what they want to do. So what I find kind of fascinating is some people look at golf and think, oh my God, it's too complicated. I can't do it, you know, but this sort of simplifies that. Talk about that process. Correct. So it's, it's that old acronym KISS, right? Keep it simple, stupid. So we, in this day and age with all the technology and all the bells and whistles that are out there, we can get bogged down by all of these numbers and angles and where we're supposed to be. And we forget that golf is really a game and it's just supposed to be played. Okay, and when we actually play the game and we get out of our own way and we don't get bogged down by, oh, I should look like Tiger Woods or I should look like Bryson DeChambeau. No, you should look like you and you should be able to do what you can do. And we're just here to bring out the best you that can be. So obviously it's supposed to be fun. Um, talk about that aspect. 
Of course, and it can be intimidating, especially when I was a youngster, everyone would get paired together. Nowadays, everyone wants to play by themselves, so he's really kind of lost that aspect of how the game is played. So I've created a lot of skills development and training sessions where we create game-like scenarios, right, that resemble on-course situations. So they're games that put pressure on you that you find on the golf course. Now, we do that in groups of six to one, so now you're interacting and interfacing with other individuals like you do on the golf course. So anytime we can put ourselves in a position that resembles the way we play, we're gonna get better and better and better. All right, and, and then for the average person, um, how many lessons does it take or how many do you do before they go, oh my gosh, this is awesome? <laughs> That's totally dependent on the person. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, generally speaking, about uh, five to ten lessons before you can really get a, a good grasp of the fundamentals, the understanding, and to sink it in. But it really comes down to the person and how much they practice in between the lesson. The individual who practices more, who does purposeful practice, because practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect, and that's what we aim for, creating a specialized practice for that individual that helps them reach their goals. What would you say to somebody who wants to do it but they're nervous about you know, trying it? Tell me. Just leave all your expectations at the door, come and have fun, enjoy the beautiful weather, enjoy the beautiful scenery, and the reality is, is this is fun. It's, a, it's an extracurricular activity. We're the only ones that put pressure on, on ourselves. And to be quite honest, I don't care if you're a tour player, a 10 handicap, or a three handicap. The beginner golfer, everyone has always been at that position. So everyone starts from scratch. Which sounds like it alleviates a lot of the stress and pressure off people. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, what we really, what we really want to do is manage people's expectations because the expectation that you have to do this way or you have to swing that way, that puts a ton more pressure on yourself and when you put pressure on yourself you don't perform as well. So you have been golfing a long time when you discovered the Rick Smith Academy what, what did you most like about it? Well you know I've been really lucky and blessed to be in this industry for a really long time and have a lot of good experiences from being mentored by Jim McLean out of Trump National Doral, um, being a director of instruction out in Hawaii. What I really loved about Rick Smith and his um, mentality was that we kind of we're the same, we're cut from the same cloth and we really just enjoy helping the individual perform the best that they can perform and not trying to create the next tour player, which we can do, sure. right? But that's not for everybody, right. right? What we wanna do is help people enjoy their leisure time better. And what's the feedback been like from the people that you're, you're teaching? Oh, it's, it's been amazing. You know, I, I've got people who have never held a golf club to, um, you know, a 15 handicap who's now a three handicap in about eight months. Um, you know, and it all stems from how much effort that person puts into it. And, you know, the feedback has just been absolutely amazing. I mean, it, it's a breathtaking facility coupled with good instruction. There's no better place on earth. Now, of course, I was going to ask you what your favorite golf course is, but I think I know the answer to that. I mean, this one's pretty good. I mean, for an old surfer from Hawaii, it's pretty good to stare at the ocean all day, every day. So, I mean, you can't really beat it. It's not too bad. Not too bad at all. You know, interesting, this is kind of one of the tougher courses. I know a lot of athletes that play out here. How do you sort of make that less intimidating for a beginner? So it's really about how we think ourselves around the golf course. Okay. You know, a lot of people try to play golf like football, yeah. where they're just going to steamroll through it, right? The way I like to articulate it is when you play a round of golf, it's really like a chess match. You need to think about it. This course is wildly demanding off the tee. Yeah. If you lose a ball off the tee, then you're teeing up number three, and you've just had a bad shot. Very high pressure. Now, if you were to take a lower club, maybe a hybrid, or three wood or a long iron, and you just put it in the fairway, well, then you've kind of knocked the teeth out of one of the most difficult golf courses in all of Southern California. So as long as we can put the ball in play, we can alleviate a lot of pressure. Now, our next story is truly going to make you hungry. We went over to Avenue Italy in the Golden Cove Shopping Center, and I can tell you, being Italian myself, you're gonna love Avenue Italy. Here's more. 
Where did you learn to cook? From your mother, your grandmother? Okay, of course, old Italians, <laughs> they, they you know, they, 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 they grow up around the kitchen yes. with, with yeah. their mom. It's a little right. bit different than over here in the United States. Right. Uh, yes, I was watching my mom a lot cooking, but uh, actually I went to the culinary school in Milan at uh, the Amerigo Vespucci. And uh, after that, I, after I graduated, I went to work in Switzerland, France. Uh, I've done some cruise line for a few years. Then I have my own restaurant in Sacramento for many, many years. And then I, de I decided to retire, so I moved back to Italy <laughs> 12 years ago, wow. but... <laughs> You're back again. Back again, yeah. Okay, well, listen, you picked a great city to come to, obviously, and beautiful restaurant here at Avenue Italy. Tell us a little bit about some of the dishes that we see in front of us. Okay. Uh, the dishes, they're very, very easy dishes to recognize. Yes. Uh, we have the classic lasagna, which we are doing very well over here. We are selling a lot of that. Uh, the spaghetti al pomodoro, very simple, but very nice and attractive. Yes, of course. Uh, to let the customers know, this is not the portion we can do a little bit <laughs> bigger. <laughs> of course. Uh, the classic cannoli alla siciliana, from where you come from. Yes. The classic tiramisu. Yeah. This is a must to have in oh an Italian gosh. restaurant. Yes. Absolutely. And uh, our uh, calamari and uh, fry shrimps, which is a big seller in, over here. Very much so. Now, when you look at a dish, oh, and we're another one here. Oh, oh boy, look at yes. that one. This is our uh, creme brulee. Very nice. <laughs> that looks delicious as well. When you see a dish like a lasagna, we see it prepared so many different ways. I see this one with many, many, many pasta layers. Yes, we do eight layers of pasta and uh, uh, lots of meat sauce and bechamel. Bechamel is a sauce from uh, Milan, Bologna. It's uh, milk and flour. It's coming like a glue, but very creamy. And you mix it up with the tomato. That's why you see kind of white layer yes. instead of red. You know, many people, they put the ricotta, which is okay. Yes. To, towards the south, that's what they use, ricotta. Mm -hmm. And you see the chunk of ricotta around. But over here, you see the layer of bechamel and tomato sauce. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. Now, do you have a favorite dish you like to cook? or? I like to cook everything. Everything. <laughs> everything. See, that's, that's what I like about Italians. They like to eat everything and cook everything, right? right? right. Well, if, if you want to if you wanna cook well, you got to taste what you cook. So, Absolutely. But uh, no, my preference, uh, of course, the pastas. Uh, myself in particular, I like fish a lot. I eat yeah. lots of fish. And we're in the perfect place for fish, right. being so close to the ocean. Yes. Yeah, and uh, also here at the restaurant, we offer many, many nice fish every day. We have lobster, we have uh, Branzino, which is the Mediterranean sea bass. That is a big seller. Of course, the salmon is always in the menu. Uh, Chilean sea bass, alibut. We have a uh, lots of seafood. A lot of choices, that's yeah. for sure. Very good. Well, the the restaurant's open seven days a week. Yes. The restaurant is open seven days a week. Uh, we open at 11 o'clock in the morning and we close at nine thirty in the evening okay. on the weekend and nine o'clock in the weekday. So lunch and dinner. Lunch and dinner. We just started also brunch. Is a sit down brunch with uh, champagne. Nice. Uh, also, we do a lots of rehearsal dinner, Christmas party, weddings. We, we are set up for that catering also. We do a lots of this stuff. And actually, now we are getting in the season, we are getting busier with yes. that. Which the is holidays, good. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, really. Which is good. We like that. Yeah. Come down here to Avenue Italy. This food looks amazing. It smells amazing. Come down here and taste it for yourself. Maurizio, thank you so much for visiting with us. Thank you. Last story takes us over to the Norris Pavilion where we attended the annual fundraiser for the Palace Verdes Women's Club Books and Authors event. Here's more on the organization and their event. Tell us about the, the Women's Club. I know it's one of the oldest on the hill. 
It is. We're 93 years. Uh, 1926 was our founding date, and uh, it's been a... Uh, an area for women in our community to be able to immediately um, know what the needs of the community are. So our organization has been around a long time and um, as most organizations it's changed and we're not getting the kind of membership that we used to but we have loyalty and dedicated people and uh, some of our new members are recently retired and that's where we're finding our niche. Tell us about the things that you do throughout the year. This is uh, your annual fundraiser, but what kind of things do, does the club do? Well, we're really, we used to have two functions uh, for fundraisers. We're down to our major one, which is uh, for scholarships and in the South Bay um, charities that would not get public funding um, that we can kind of support smaller charities that are doing great work. Um, Warriors Pantry is one for students um, that need uh, nourishment while they're going to school and may not um, always have the funds to do that. Uh, especially Handmade is a um, women's prison uh, organization that this woman has them making special scarves that are sold around and funds go to help shelters for women that, that are in an abusive situation. So those are our kind of focuses and um, our scholarships um, this year were uh, our three high schools here on the peninsula and we had um, college bound Dartmouth um, student, um, New York University, North Texas University and we have um, uh, Harvard College is always one of those focuses that we want students here to be able to get assistance for. How do you find the students? Well our counselors in our three high schools have a relationship with PV Women's Club going back many, many years, and they've just been a, a great source. They have candidates that we evaluate, and then um, we go to their uh, annual association uh, awards dinners, and uh, they come to our final meeting in June. And it's always just wonderful to see these kids that are so deserving. So this is your annual fundraiser. It's always a lot of fun to come here, books and authors. Tell us a little bit about the event and who's coming today. Well, we have um, been attracting mystery, mystery writers for the last several years, and three of our authors come from Men of Mystery, which is an event in Long Beach that um, has really supported um, our fundraiser as well by being here. Um, we have two local women, um, Laura Shea, who's here in Malaga Cove, that's written her first novel, and Gwendolyn Womack, who is uh, an LA-based um, author, that's had um, a variety of uh, big studio screenplay experience. Many of our, I think all three of our uh, mystery writers and the two women have had um, studio experience writing screenplays and uh, TV sitcoms and that kind of thing. Our sixth is Quay Corte, and he is a physician in Pasadena that retired after 25 years and is now doing um, authorship full time. I know there's so many authors to choose from. How do you do it every year? You always have great people coming. Well, it's really surprising how word of mouth um, helps that of, activity. Um, we do have a source with uh, a gal from the Orange County uh, Literary Guild, Jan Wilcox, who's just been a real funnel for us the last four years. And there are categories that we wouldn't normally be able to know about. And um, then authors that have been here have also recommended people this year that have, have been at our events in the past. So it's just every year I'm amazed at how six authors uh, present themselves to us. My books are fantastical thrillers that travel through time but in different ways. Uh, one's a reincarnation thriller, one's about the world's first tarot cards, and one is about a master psychometrist who can touch objects and see the memory within them. What inspired you to go in that genre? Uh, I just love to research, um, you know, metaphysical ideas and psychic abilities and weave them into fiction. And I just have a lot of fun with uh, creating that what if. Uh, What's it like to be in a community like this at an event like this and talking to people and just kind of having that communication with residents? Um, everyone is just very supportive. Uh, as a local author, I just I get invited to wonderful book events, and everyone is just very, um, you know, there are a lot of book lovers that 
just support their authors. Well, this is my first book, so uh, singular. Only one book. This is my first book I wrote. Okay. I'm a uh, reformed screenwriter. Been writing screenplays for three decades. Have had a few movies made, and now very happily transitioning to writing books. What inspired you to make the transition? Uh, wanting something to write. And uh, it's getting increasingly difficult to write movies about people. And uh, the book world uh, is more receptive to stories about human characters and human ideas and, and uh, just great situations. So um, that's really what prompted me to do it. The book that we're featuring today is um, called Death by His Grace. And it's set in Ghana where I grew up. Um, and the background is the religious uh, community in Ghana, which is very active. And uh, in fact, Ghana was voted in 2012 as the most religious uh, country in the world. <laughs> and we're talking about evangelical and Pentecostal movements. And um, the name Death by His Grace comes from a... Um, a custom in Ghana where if somebody asks you how are you doing or how are you, you say by his grace. In other words, by his grace I'm doing well. So that phrase comes up so often in speech, I thought to myself, well, if by his grace applies to almost everything, then death and murder also follows. And that's how I chose the title. So in general, it's um, about um, a very beautiful uh, young woman who uh, was found murdered uh, in, in her home. And there are a number of suspects, and they include a very rich pastor who we meet in the course of the book. So that, that background of religion is very, very uh, much there. Cape May is uh, my debut novel. It's uh, my first novel. It's a, uh, set in 1957, and it's about a, uh, um, a newlywed couple uh, from Georgia who go to Cape May, New Jersey for their honeymoon. Uh, they're innocent and virginal, and uh, they uh, feel sort of shy and uncomfortable at first. It's a, They go in the off-season, and it's kind of like deserted, uh, and they decide to cut their honeymoon short. But uh, just before... Just before they leave, uh, they end up meeting this group of glamorous, dissolute people who end up upending their marriage. Um, and so it's a very, it's a sexy book, atmospheric. Um, it was described by one reviewer as um, Marilyn, it's as if Marilyn Robinson went on a gin and tonics bender and wrote a Henry Miller novel, <laughs> and then it's crashed by Gatsby characters, you know, so. What, what, was, your, what was your inspiration? Uh, I was, it grew out of a previous novel attempt. Um, I'd been writing a darker, uh, this novel that drew on my family's history from Georgia, uh, and, it, and it had to do with race and murder and was set in the Jim Crow South, and I kept spinning my wheels on it. But um, I, I would just keep going on these tangents with that novel. I would send couples off into the woods to do, you know, to get it on with each other, and I was like, wait, that has nothing to do with murder and race. So, um, but finally, I just kind of gave into it. Uh, I, I, for t two of the characters in that novel, I decided to marry off for reasons that made sense at the time and send on a honeymoon, and then I just couldn't stop writing. Love the title of your book here, Mom's Night Out. Give us, a, Tell us a little bit about the book. All right, Mom's Night Out is the story of a group of Hermosa Beach moms who, in the middle of a crime spree or a crime wave, they decide to take on the criminals themselves. Ooh. And they do it on their monthly mom's night, nights out until they get in over their heads and they decide to take on the drug dealers who rule the pier. And what was your inspiration for the book? Um, it was my friends when I first had my kids. My wallet got stolen and the cop who came over to my house kind of told me all these things that were going on in Hermosa that I had no idea. And I just thought, who better to fight this than the moms who are the eyes and the ears of the entire town. And I kind of took it just a little too far. <laughs> and that's so interesting. So how long have you been writing? So I started this like eight years ago, which is, I know, it's embarrassing. Um, it's bad but it was a hobby at first and just the kids were little and we moved a couple of times and just always took a back seat and so I published it a year ago and now it's sort of slowly becoming my full-time job. 
Lastly, um, you ladies are such a tight-knit group. I know that. Um, just tell us a little bit about the camaraderie that you share with the ladies. Well, it's a real, some of these women have been together 30 and 40 years. We've lost two valuable members. They're all valuable, but cherished members last year. And um, we do social things as well, but our meetings every month also have some key uh, speaker or entertainment that is also um, kind of a camaraderie uh, for us every month. We meet at uh, Mary and Joseph's Retreat House here on the hill, and it's um, it's a sisterhood um, that has a several generations that really kind of knits us together. And that will do it for today's show. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Maria Soreo, and we'll see you next time around the peninsula.